and welcome everybody. It is so great to have you here with us. I am really excited for today's session of Learn at Work Live. We have Dr. Nicholas Powell here with us, and I'm really excited for you to hear all the amazing stuff and ideas and strategies that he has to share with you on how to turn strategic planning from a simple document into a discipline in your organization. So welcome, thanks for being here. Uh, if you have to hop, up, hop off early, don't worry, we're recording, so you won't miss a thing. We'll be sending you that recording link and a handout next week. Uh, also, please don't be shy. Share your thoughts, your perspectives, your questions, your ideas in the chat with us. We'll be saving some time at the end for questions and things. I'll be trying to keep track of those along the way, but we want to hear from you. And there's so many of our friends on here with us, so please don't be shy. We want to hear from you. Uh, as I mentioned, we are here with Dr. Nicholas Powell, and I'm really excited to, if you haven't met him already, to introduce him to all of you. He's an esteemed alumni of ours from the Implementation Leadership Academy and 102 Leading in the Adaptive Space. He's got quite a background, so I uh, am going to tell you a bits and pieces about that in a moment, but I think what I love most about Dr. Powell is he's a pracademic, and if you're like, what in the world does that mean? It is this wonderful mix of a practitioner and someone who's been working in the field for a long, long time and has that real-world experience and this rich history and background in academia, and he does such a great job of blending the two of those things together, and so I think you're going to see how he's been able to take science and put it into practice. And he's got a lot of tips and tricks to share with you today. Uh, what I know about Dr. Powell is he started his career as a juvenile probation officer and has worked his way up along the way and is now the Director of Strategic Planning and Analysis for Georgia Department of Community Supervision. In that role, he really tries to bring together strategies that improve criminal justice outcomes across his agency and reduce negative consequences that are occurring for people in our system. System. He serves as criminal justice professor at Georgia Southern University and is also a post-certified instructor, and he's most interested in things that happen in the intersection of the legal system, so between systems like probation, parole, and incarceration, but also across contextual factors like addiction, homelessness, and mental health. So today, Dr. Powell is going to be sharing with us how he's used the science of implementation and leadership to transform how he looks at and goes about the strategic planning process and how he uh, uses that process to create more than just a simple document, but really a disciplined approach that drives his agency and their work. And so welcome, Dr. Powell. Thanks for being here with us today. Um, I'm going to talk less and let you talk more because you have all the goods to say. So I thought maybe we could start by you telling us a little bit about how how we met and how we came to know each other and, and maybe some more detail about your history in the field. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for that nice introduction, Alex, and uh, for the opportunity to be here and chat with you today. Always uh, always enjoy our chats. Um, but yeah, you and uh, I got I came across uh, your work in the in the Implementation Leadership Academy um, as part of a research project that I was doing with um, the University of North Carolina. We're looking to do some research in our um, our mental health arena, which I'll talk more about that strategy later. Um, and uh, we were recommended from a colleague that me and the uh, principal investigator from UNC that were working on the research partner take uh, your Implementation Leadership Academy together. Um, so what we found by doing that was that the with the the lessons from the academy and and having some of that common language as we were uh you know launching and steering an implement implementation team ourselves for our mental health strategy um it, it gave us kind of a common ground uh to work from so um i think that's why uh you and i have gotten along so well um and benefit mm -hmm. from each other's work um and and that that strategy is going going really well 
And um, and I think that the the lesson from the invitation implementation leadership academy um certainly certainly helped that along. Oh, that's awesome. Well, yes, it's always nice to meet um, someone who enjoys geeking out about science and things. We have some fellow geeks on here with us. I see who you are on that list. So um, I'm excited for you to share more about how you've used this process. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, though. I've always found strategic planning to be kind of dry and boring. And so I'm curious, how did you get involved in like the world of strategic planning and you've often referred to it as this discipline. It's become a discipline for you. So can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that? Yeah, you know, and and, and strategic planning, I think how it's conventionally conventionally done is it, it, it is boring and dry. So no offense taken. Um, but I think a lot of people look at it as like a, you know, an, um, you know, a document that you have to fill out once a year to satisfy some kind of like governing mandate, you know, whether it's from your city manager or, or the governor's office or, you know, whoever, whoever your governing entity is. Um, so I think most of the time people look at it as just a way to, you know, mark that off the list. Some people even hire third parties to come in and do it. Um, I'm luckily enough, luckily enough uh, to work for an agency that, that, that um, kind of safeguards the importance of strategic planning. And, and it's something that we're, we're constantly engaged in. And, and that's kind of, I guess, like the title of this conversation, um, a discipline, not a talk. I guess that's kind of what I've been championing, championing for the last few years is to try to encourage people, especially people in the public service field, um, to, to start strategizing and stop reacting, right? Because oh. I think that's, uh, it, it's, People come into this field. I know in community supervision, and you know, and I've, I've, you know, I've taught at Command College and taught at these different, these different arenas where I've, I've seen uh, similar experiences with police and fire and sheriffs and all that. But people come into these fields with, um, with, with the best of intentions, right? People go into public service not for a fat paycheck, certainly not for, <laughs> for glory, but because they want to help people. They want to give back to their community. They want to protect people, and and it, and it looks in all kinds of different ways. But the problem is, is they is they they get in these roles and then they get hit hit in the face with a bunch of bureaucracy, a bunch of public scrutiny, um, a bunch of budget cuts, low resources. And then, you know, they spend their time, you know, disgruntled and putting out fires mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, uh, practicing a discipline of, of strategizing and, and, and making moves that's going to make meaningful change. To, to fulfill the mission and vision of that public service agency, which to me is really cool because when, when you're, when you find yourself back to where you're making moves to fulfill that mission and vision, now you're getting connected back to what brought you into the field to begin with. So am I hearing that you really see strategic planning as a way of staying true to your why and like making that happen in your day-to-day -day work? Absolutely. So, so in its in its simplest terms, strategic planning is charting the course from your mission, which is why you exist, to your vision, what you want to become, right? Mm -hmm. And if and if your why mm -hmm. isn't connected to that path at all, then you're in the wrong business, and that's okay. Yeah. We'll go find the business that's right for you. But most <laughs> of the time, what I see is that people people do have they just they just they it gets disconnected somewhere, and that's why the strategic planning is so important. Because you know, on one hand, we got to constantly, you know, bring in our mission to life. Like, hey, this is why we're here. This is why we exist. I know we're frustrated that people didn't put gas in the cars. I know we're frustrated that someone didn't refill the paper towel in the bathroom. But that's not why we're here. You know, we're here as a community su supervision agency to provide uh, supervision and, and promote successful outcomes, to protect our community, all these wonderful things. That's why we're here. And then our vision is, is what we wanna become. It's like, how can we be the, you know, the national leader in providing progressive and innovative community supervision, right? So really everything that you're dealing with is, is how are you getting from that mission of why you exist to that vision of what you wanna become. Everything else is kind of just noise. And I think, you know, strategic planners, do a good uh, or good strategic leaders do a good job of discerning the difference between what is going to get us from that mission of vision and what is a distraction. Mm, I love that. I can't wait. Um, it's important to note that Dr. Powell brought some really great examples. So I can't wait to kind of dig into like, what does that actually look like in practice? And at risk of jumping ahead though, let's kind of start from 
So you came to the Implementation Leadership Academy. You already had a ton of experience, a, t- a amazing background, all this good stuff going. Um, what was it like to you, for you to go through the Leadership Academy and what did you find valuable from that? Um, it, to be honest with you, um, it, it was a paradigm shift. It, 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 it broadened the way I looked at strategic planning in the sense of like, um, it improved the way I thought about the people that may be implementing the mm. strategies. Right. So, yeah. So like, you know, we always joke is like, so, you know, a couple of times a year, me and, 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 and all the other leaders of the agency, we get together and, you know, we, we flesh out our strategic plan and we do it, we do it by committee, you know, with our, or with our agency head leading the conversation. And then all the other division heads there um, contributing, you know, and I always joke, I'm just a schmuck who has to write it all down, but like, but you know, the, but after we leave those conversations and I'm always charged and I love those conversations, you know, frontline staffs are the ones at the end of the day carrying out this important work. And yeah. while I've always valued frontline staff, I don't think I've ever, I'd like to think that I haven't ever lost sight of that, how, you know, I've, I've always continued to teach and stuff like that. So I've, I've always appreciated them. I didn't, the Implementation Leadership Academy made me start thinking about some of the little nuances that might make a difference of when you're, of, of when you're asking someone to do something new, mm-hmm. right? Right. Like, like giving them time to mourn the old way, no matter how good the new way is, no matter how mm-hmm. right the new strategy is, give, you have to give them time to mourn the old way. Or like, if you're asking them to do something new, what are you asking them to stop doing that they used to do? Or, or just this idea of like, um, one of the biggest things, and, and we'll talk about this more, I'm sure, but um, this idea of building implementation capacity, right? So a lot of times there's like these tips. Sorry, I've got a, a Apple monitor, so it, it does bubbles when I don't mean it to. Um, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> let me know I'm talking with my hands too much, I guess. But oh, I uh, love it. But this idea of building implementation capacity, right? Like what are we as leaders, like if we see that that the frontline staff is having a hard time implementing a strategy, right? Like- are we taking a deeper dive to think that what are we doing from a leadership standpoint to to build that capacity for, right? To to make it happen because a lot of times you know, uh, um, you know you might hear some gripes or something like that, but you know those are really just symptoms. So how can we, how can we, um, what what's really going on? Like why are they having a hard time with them? Do we not give them time to more in the old way? Do we move too fast? Do we ask them to do too much? Do they have yeah. what they need to be able to implement the new strategy? So anyway, so the the the, the Leadership Academy just got me thinking about that stuff, stuff a lot more. And I think it, um, I think it's made my, my ability to, to facilitate strategic du- discussions much more, um, much more fruitful, um, productive and, um, and consider it. Oh, I love that. Well, let's, let's dig into kind of some of those specific shifts that you made, because I want to hear more about what that meant in practice for you in terms of how you might've showed up differently or gone about things like strategic planning differently as a result. So can you tell us a little bit about how that created a shift in your approach? Sure. So like, uh, like, like an example that we've, we've done, um, you know, from a strategic standpoint at our agency is, is just redefining what success looks like you know, for a community supervision officer. And, you know, and I, and I think this can apply for everybody else. It's like, look at that mission and our vision. What do we expect officers to do, right? We expect officers to provide supervision, hold people accountable, uh, help them address their needs, link them to resources, resources, follow up on those linkages and, and promote successful outcomes, which in turn will increase public safety, right? But when we talk about community su- community supervision, what do we talk about? We talk about homelessness. We talk about employment. We talk about recidivism. All mm-hmm. things that an officer has absolutely no direct control over, mm-hmm. right? So, and and I'll give you I'll give you an example of this. So I, I had the um, I was the, I don't want to say privilege, but I was I was honored to be asked to help our um our commissioner deliver deliver some data to our uh, our board one time. And he's going through and he's giving these different data, arrest rates, all this stuff. And he gives the employment rate for the people on felony probation and parole in Georgia, which was 69%, which, you know, me as someone who's, you know, spends time looking at these numbers, like, I know that's pretty dang good, um, is that 69% of people with a with a felony record have a job, right? Mm-hmm. So 
you know, but the board, you know, they, I mean, they were peppering my boss with questions about like, you know, how come this isn't higher? Why do you think this is? And, and, you know, my, my boss did a great job, you know, he's, you know, trying to, trying to talk about the labor market and stuff outside of our control and stuff like that. I even tried to chime in unsuccessfully and, you know, explain that like, <laughs> you know, like statistically speaking, you know, it's, it's harder for a person with a criminal record to get a job today than it was to get a job during the great depression. Wow. All this, all this is, is just going over their heads. And, and so I went back and, you know, and this, and this really stuck with me and I reflected on it. I'm like, you know, and I asked myself, like, how do I wish that conversation would have went? Hmm. And what I, and, and, and I thought on this for a few days, Alex, and what I thought of is like, instead of uh, me and my boss trying to, you know, appease this group of people that were asking questions as concerned citizens. Okay. Like I'm not criticizing the question. I get it that we presented you the, the employment rate, the 69% employment rate. Right. So what, so I, what if our commissioner could have said, I can't really speak to the 69% employment rate because, you know, we can't give people jobs. But what I can tell you is that of the people who are unemployed and looking for work, my officers are helping 100% of them. Mm -hmm. Right. And just that little bit of framing. Right. And I think yeah. if we could say that we, we, it would have, it would have went very well in the conversation. So we kind of have revamped our entire performance measurement system, gauging performance, um, to, to reflect what, what, what we would expect a good officer is already doing out in the field. And that is, if someone has an addiction need, are you helping them address that need? If someone has a mental health need, are you helping them address that need? And that's how we gauge success. So I love if, that. And, and so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. But yeah, but it is, it's basically like just focusing on something that's 100% in the officer's control and like those lag outcomes, like recidivism and stuff like that, that us, that us academics and scientists love to, you know, hang the moon on. Mm -hmm. trust they'll come trust that they'll come. If employment is really related to recidivism, then if you're helping people find employment, then, then that recidivism will take care of itself. Um, but that's that takes discipline, right? Because we want to jump right to the lowering the recidivism rates or lowering the arrest rates yeah. or stuff like that. So I remember a time in my career where we were asked as a group to reduce escape rates by like 20% in three months. And it was like, what? How in the world do you do that? Right. Um, I would have loved a reframe around what would you like, what can I focus on that we think would lead to a reduction in escape rates? So I just, I love that simple shift in, I mean, it sounds simple. I'm sure it's much harder in practice, but to resist the urge to go for these big picture things and really focus on what can I do today? to right. make a difference well and then like your escape example and i see this when i when i teach strategic planning um you know to you know police chiefs and and different administrators you know they'll you know say they're taking a they're doing a you know a class assignment and their 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 pet topic is um you know reducing gang violence you know someone is going to come up and say like they're going to measure success by the number of arrests right and I always kind of like push back on them. Like, I mean, is that really like, so you arrest all the gang members, then what happens? Right. You can't be successful anymore or what? And so I kind of like push them. Like, like I, I get like, yeah, like ideally you're going to see the, you know, arrests go up or, or, or gang violence go down, whatever, like whatever it is that you're working for. The topic doesn't, doesn't really matter. Ideally that's what you're wanting to see. Right. And that might even yeah. be your vision. Right. Um, but like, but what are you doing that you can control that you're going to do better, right? So, and then they, then they, then they start getting a lot more strategic, and they start getting into how they want to have deeper investigations, how they want to build stronger community trust, and they start coming up with some real substantial strategies that you can see could make a difference in their communities. But that oh, first wow. pass, they jump, they jump right to the end of the book, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? They went, they went ahead and read the last page. Like we're going to reduce gang violence. Um, and I think that I think that's the part that's um so important about controlling the controllable. That's awesome. So you're, when you go to do strategic planning and, and I want to kind of circle back to, you talked earlier, you know, you go from doing it once a year to kind of doing it often and always and in everything that you do, 
you're kind of stepping back from those big picture outcomes and moving into more tangible things that you can see in the day to day. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You mentioned building capacity, and I know that that's a part of the shift that you've made. How does doing that help you to build capacity in your organization? Um, I think by by bringing that mission to life, bringing that vision to life, and then charting out a strategic direction that everyone in the agency, from a frontline staff to HR to IT, can coalesce around, right? It gives it, it it helps us build implementation capacity because we can see, hey, these are our top strategic priorities. Mm -hmm. So when you're faced with, with with a choice, two choices, the option is always the same. It's going to be the one that's most mission critical, right? Oh, I love that. And that's what helps us make those hard decisions. It may, helps us make them in the heat of the moment, right? So I talked earlier about how, you know, people in public service, you know, they're all, they're running around putting out fires, they're dealing with bureaucracy and all this stuff. So when the cannon goes boom, sometimes they don't feel like they have time to think, which is why you have to be hardwired to think strategically. You have to be hardwired to think mission critical right from the beginning. And if you've got that in your brain, like by constantly engaging in these conversations, like I said, we meet twice a year, but we talk strategic planning all year long. Uh, whether it's different groups or 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 whatever, but like um, but the the more you talk about it, the more you embody the principles of being strategic, of of being deliberate, um, by treating uh making choices for your work by design rather than letting them happen by default, um, yeah. then then <clears throat> the more capacity you can build and and cultivate a, a an environment where strategies can be implemented successfully. Oh man, I'm getting all excited here. Um, <laughs> that's so exciting. And I could imagine that if you're if you're strategic planning around recidivism and things go boom, right? Your choices might look more scattered or less aligned or more um disparate somehow than if you have a very clear, kind of closer strategic plan and deliverables and things that you're focused on when things go boom. It's a little bit more about like, what can I actually do instead of all these kind of big picture things that might pull you in different directions? Absolutely. And, and I think that's what's so important about taking the time to have these conversations, like defining what success means to us, communicating what that success looks like to your people. You know, one of, mm -hmm. one of my uh, favorite colleagues, Dr. Maria Stevenson, she always says, people can't bowl a strike if they don't know where the pins are, Right. So if you've set if you've set up your pins in, in some kind of disorganized fashion, in a sense of like by hanging it on recidivism, where then all of a sudden now you get a more lenient judge. Now you got a task force sweeping through your community. Now you've got a, a you know, a, a, you know, a, a tougher police chief. Um, all these things that can affect recidivism that, that you have nothing to do with. So now when all of a sudden that's spiking or dipping drastically in a way. You're, you're going to do one or two things. You're going to either just completely become non-strategic, disconnected from your mission or your vision, or even worse, you're going to make decisions based on short-term fluctuations rather than long-term trends. So I think at the beginning, you want to make sure that you're you're setting up those those pins in the right place so that you can be comfortable of, of what bull on a strike looks like. Ah, I love that. You can think so yeah. what's that? You can thank Maria for that one. I stole it from her. Oh, thank you, Maria. That's a good one. No, I love it. It's a very great visual about this work. So when we talked about this idea, this way that you've applied these concepts and kind of shifted how you approach this work, you described the movement from going from like strategic planning as a document to strategic planning as a disciplined approach to your day-to-day -day work. You described it to me as going deeper by getting basic. And I remember feeling like, you know, that commercial where people's brains used to go poof, like and purple stuff came out. I remember feeling like poof, that's brilliant. I love it. So can you tell us a little bit about what you meant by that? Because I know it was really meaningful for me. Yeah. And, and, and you know, uh, <laughs> I joke with my with my colleagues and friends that, you know, I sound like a broken record, but like that's okay because I feel like when mm -hmm. people know what you're going to say, that means that means you're be that means you're being heard. Um, and I think for a two, true strategic agency, people should be able to predict what you're going to say because you're speaking on mission. It's not it's not about a person; 
It's about that mission and vision. Um, so what I mean by that is, yeah, getting back to the basics is is making sure that you're discerning between what you can control and what you can't control, right? And discerning between what is mission critical and what's not, what's just a nice to have, right? Because here's the thing, people who come in this work, I've noticed they got big hearts and they will take on, they will take on so much stuff to the point where they absolutely just brutalize themselves emotionally, physically, um, it'll hurt their families and all this stuff. But, but understanding that you can't be everything to everybody, right? All you can do is focus on what your mission or your vision is. And even more than that, what's your job, individual responsibility is to contribute to this larger mission and vision. That's all you can focus on. And I'll give you an example. So we did one thing with strategic planning. And I think how I, how I got into it is because, you know, <clears throat> my, my agency leaders recognize the importance of tying strategic planning and research together, right? So mm -hmm. uh, you may have talked about before, like, um, you know, evidence-based practices, it's a verb, it's not a noun, like it's something that we're constantly doing. We're constantly monitoring our work so that we can you know, use the findings to make adjustments, mm -hmm. to drive strategies, right? So we did just this, we looked at our mental health um, population, people with serious mental illness. And big shocker, people with serious mental illness were faring worse on supervision than everybody else in the criminal justice, everybody else on probation and parole in Georgia. Even though uh, mental illness is not a reliable predictor of criminal behavior. So they were having, they were being arrested more often. They were being, having, uh, you know, probation revocations where their probation term was like taken away from them and they were sent to prison more often. And those revocations were more often for technical violations than the general population, which means not for committing a new offense, but for not being able to adhere to the conditions of a probation or parole. Mm -hmm. And then so <clears throat> even worse, we found that uh, our specialized mental health supervision, right, where you like cap the caseloads, you get these specialized officers with extra training, and you let them focus exclusively on mental health supervision. The, um, the PET model is like the, the Jennifer scheme, prototypical model, right? Um, mm -hmm. so, so they got a caseload of like 50 people, they're specialized trained. It's exclusively mental mental illness. And the whole point is they're supposed to engage in more problem solving. Um, these are typically your more patient officers. And um, and then that way we can promote better outcomes. But our analysis showed that it wasn't effective, right? Wow. It wasn't effective. And um, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't moving the mark. There was no significant relationship between the intervention, right? So, mm -hmm. which one thing I love about my agency is that doesn't scare us. That doesn't scare us. And, and you have to build that culture. Like if you're going to have this culture of evidence-based practices where you're constantly studying and learning, mm -hmm. then you got you can't be afraid. You're not it all. It is always going to be favorable. The difference is what are you going to do about it, right? Mm -hmm. But we learned this. Now we didn't throw out the specialized mental health supervision because we've got it's a promising practice. There's 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 mixed findings on it, but but people have shown that like um, officers are more patient in this setting. That uh, people are more likely to engage in mental health treatment in this setting. So so we did we weren't ready to throw that out. And looking at the officers who were in these positions, we felt like we were putting the right officers in the positions. These mm -hmm. officers care. You let them talk uh, for a couple minutes about the mental health caseload, you can you can hear the passion, but you can also hear the burnout. Oh. You can also hear the burnout. So, so we presented these findings to some stakeholders. And of course, everybody on the call, and I, th and I think if you presented this to 100 people, 99 of them would say, what everybody else on the call said in that we need more mental health resources. Mm. Right. Yeah. I can't argue with that, but my agency, our mission vision isn't about delivering mental health services. Right. So yeah, that's a conversation for you all to have, but that's not my, that's not my lane. That's not my business. And so this getting basic, like I think sometimes may seem a little cold, but it's focusing on what's, what's in my lane, what I'm focused on my mission and vision. I'm vision centered. Right. We, our focus is to, deliver effective supervision. We got the right officers there. The intervention's not effective. The officers are burned out. We had we had done some study before that showed that the more, that for every um, person with mental illness on officer's caseload, the more emotional exhaustion, depression, role conflict, role overload, work stress, an officer wow. experiences. So we came up with a strategy of, we're gonna bring in one therapist 
not for the people in supervision, for our officers. And now they staff cases with the officers, um, provide them guidance, let them vent, um, you know, talk to them about potential ways to address the issues. But the and all and so the officers can do do their job better. So the idea is if we can take care of the officers, the officers will take care of the services. And so the client, the client for the therapist is the officer. Not that we're making all our officers go to therapy. That's not that. Now, if they want to talk, the door's open. That's that's up to them what they do with that time. Um, um, and of course it can be confident, whatever, whatever however they want that to look. Um, mm-hmm. that's fine. But the idea is, you know, whenever, you know, so like I said, so you ask a, a hundred people, 99 of them are going to tell you, we just need more mental health services. We need more mental health services. But the one strategic leader is going to tell you, no, we, we need to enhance our vision. We need to buttress our mission and our vision. We need to support what, what we're here to do, which is provide supervision. We got the right officers. They're burned out. Let's take care of them. They'll take care of the services. The services will take care of recidivism. So it seems simple when you say it like that, but these are really hard decisions and they're really hard to get people to see sometimes uh, at the ground level, at the ground level. I love that example that you, you didn't just throw the baby out with the bathwater and you didn't go chasing all sorts of things that were out of scope and outside of what you describe as your lane that you thought about, like, what's our vision and mission and strategically, what can we do to get to be better and do better within that space? And it led you to taking better care of your people. How magic is that? Right. I, I think that's amazing. What a great example. Thanks for sharing that. And I love, I do see, um, I hope our audience can see it too, how you could have gone all over the place and spent all sorts of time, effort, energy, and resource chasing down grants and trying to get more providers and, you know, trying to offer more services. And I can't tell you, as I reflect on my career in this moment, how many times I've been that person running around trying to add more, more, more. And it's, instead you got basic. It's so easy to do. And especially when you got, when you're dealing with these, these helpers, people in these helping professions, right? Like, so they want to be everything to everybody. And it's like, you know, as I said, like, I do. You know, I, yeah, I see it all the time. And, um, you know, I have to, I try to pull people back all the time. And it's like, you know, it's like, you know, I've got a passion for like, you know, wanting to, you know, support them, want to help people, but the more focused they can be, the more productive they can be. So I think what we see a lot of times and, and, and people will let us do it is like, is, is this mission blend, right? Where we're really trying to do two different missions. I've learned, uh, learned about this a lot with the, with the idea of mental health supervision. It's like, do our officers really need to be giving mental health services? I mean, do they really need to be like talking to a talking to a person about what kind of meds they should be taking? Or do we need to just make sure that they're able to do supervision and and guide that person along, link them to the right resources, mm. uh, advocate for them if, if they feel like they need to uh, talk to their doctor about adjusting their meds, you know, coach them on doing that. They don't need to know what the meds are. So it's this idea of like, of, of getting away from mission blend and, and making sure you're breaking off. This is our mission. And then that's going to help because we already, we already got someone we in Georgia, it's called the department of behavioral health and developmental disabilities, DBHDD. It's, it's a long one. I always forget it, but, um, but we are, we already have a department where their mission is to provide mental health services. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so instead of creating a red, a redundancy and not doing our mission as well, and then like dipping our toe into their mission, get rid of that mission blend do what we do and do it better so that we can better link with with our partner agency and let them do what they do so it takes trust it takes focus and it takes discipline by recognizing where your part stops yeah and really being okay with doing what you do well and not trying to like be everything for everybody that's right i love it So let's dig into some of that data. So as far as I understand it from our conversations, by getting basic, you've seen some tremendous success. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, conventionally, you know, probation and parole was defined as, uh, I mean, it was was kind of measured by 
you know, what, what could easily be counted, right? Like who was paying their fees? Uh, how many positive drug tests that were there? Uh, recidivism, um, mm -hmm. but mostly like contacts, how often you were seeing a person, contacts, interactions, whatever. But like, you know, are you seeing these people the number of times you're supposed to be seeing them? That's what drove probation. That and hoping that your case didn't end up on the news. Mm -hmm. So so when we wanted to get away from this contact-driven model, this surveillance model, so that we could have more of a quality-driven model, we had to we had to replace it with something. So that's, that's when we uh, conceptualized um, person-centered supervision as a way to represent our suite of evidence-based practices that we use as an agency, right? Uh, and these are these are procedural justice principles. These are motivational interviewing, um, which we call enhanced supervision program, um, co cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, uh, or cognitive structural model, like um, addressing criminogenic needs, risk need responsivity, all these different things that the that the research literature shows us will work in community supervision if done with fidelity. Mm kind of conceptualize them as our person-centered supervision. But we talk about it in a way like, I'm not as worried about an officer being able to tell, define what responsivity is. But I do want them to understand that with our person-centered supervision model, we recognize people as unique individuals with their own strengths, needs, and goals. And then we prioritize those activities that are going to promote success on their supervision. So that's how we've done it. And then now, so we measure their performance by... Uh, whether or not they're addressing their needs, whether or not they're using those effective communication skills. Wow. I, that sounds like a big shift. It is a big shift. Um, but I, I think it's coming along. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's hard to tell. Yeah. Well, I've learned from, from your training. You don't want to be too confident. In that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but also it sounds like you're one, focusing on what you have control and influence over and doing it incrementally over time with a real focus on quality over any sort of quantity. And all of those things really align with the science of implementation and how to help people make small, incremental, sustainable changes over time that really bring those big results down the road. Right. And that's the that's the thing that, that has probably been the biggest key to the success is our field leadership has recognized um, the importance of that incremental change, right? Mm. Because e even with these well-intentioned, um, good-hearted measures, uh, way of measuring success, like, oh, if someone has addiction, are you helping them find, address that need, right? Um, if you try to move too hard too fast, if you try to do it by finger wagging instead of promoting per person-centered supervision, then you're going to, then you're going to promote um, bean counting, number chasing, which is going to yeah. compromise your data integrity, right? So our our um, our <clears throat> field leadership, uh, frontline leadership, has done a really good job of of taking their time rolling this out, right? Taking their time saying, hey, you just focus on person the the concept of person centered supervision, the numbers will follow. You just focus on. Get, meeting that person where they are, getting them what they need in that moment to promote success. And the numbers oh, will follow. Yeah. So they actually set pretty reasonable targets to 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 hit these measures of what's considered success. Um, and I think that's been that's been key on on implementing person center supervision with fidelity. I love that. So you have Two examples that we've talked through a few different times that you're willing, you can share with the audience here today on how this works in practice and what you've been able to accomplish thus far. Would it be okay if we started with the example about enhanced supervision programming? Sure. Okay. So let's, what are we looking at here with this data? Yeah. So our, our enhanced supervision program, like I said, this is, you know, you know, some places call it like epics Two is really what it's modeled after, but it's like motivational interviewing. Um, it's got the cognitive structural model in it. It's using um, or statement, the open-ended questions, affirmations, reinforcement, summary statements, um, all the stuff that's basically effective communication. So that was, that was one of the things that, that we really wanted to focus on. If we're going to have quality interactions, if we're going to loosen up on how often we're seeing people, we're going to make, make sure that we're focusing on seeing the people who need our services the most, then we wanted to make sure that we were getting the most out of their interaction. So we trained all of our officers in this enhanced supervision program, right? Basically, so that they can effectively communicate 
with people on supervision. And before this model, we weren't measuring it. We weren't talking about it. We weren't, it wasn't tied to person or supervision. It wasn't tied to the mission or the vision. It was just something we asked them to do. And as you can see mm. in 20, I took a, uh, just a quick little pulse and, you know, less than 10% of the time an officer was meeting with somebody was, were they using one of these skills? Oh, wow. And so what this shows is that that's about the time we started rolling out this person-centered supervision model. And so when we started talking about like, you know, the quality of interactions and what you're doing when you, when you are in front of somebody, um, how you're spending that time, how you're helping them address those needs, um, we started seeing the number, the number shoot up. Amazing. That's the, that's the 37% climb that you see there. And if I understand our conversations, it's it's your belief that a large part of this success has to do with taking a very disciplined and strategic approach to going deep by getting basic and staying true to your vision and mission, all things that are centered around how you can kind of set up the strategic planning process and put it into action in your day to day. Absolutely. And, and, and sometimes, cause you know, I'm telling you all this stuff, first of all, I'm speaking for an entire agency. So let me make that real clear to everybody on the call. Like there's a lot of people's, I'm talking about a lot of people's hard work, um, as an agency, not, not mine, um, by any means. Um, <clears throat> I'm talking about the agency strategy, um, who I'm just one player in. Um, but the second thing is, is like, you know, I might talk about stuff like it's a strategy or whatever, because it's, it's work, but one, you know, and we'll talk about this, I think in a couple of slides, one is like, not all our strategies work, right? It's just being willing to to pivot when you're finding they don't work. And two, sometimes you 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 stumble upon some happy coincidences. And with this ESP, Alex, I'll share this with you. So we did a, a workload analysis and found that officers, like 70% of their time was taken up by administrative stuff, not supervision, not mm -hmm. our core mission, right? So where in the past people were really, and this was before the pandemic, people were really hesitant to do video interactions because this, you know, some of the solutions of like, well, you're not going to catch people doing wrong or stuff like that, even though anybody who's been in the field knows, I mean, if they're doing something wrong, they're just not going to answer the door when you knock on it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, but but we we kind of we couldn't get over that that hump to be able to use video interactions. But when we found the time and how much time our officers were lacking, we it was a call to action. We had to do something. So, you know, our, our field team came up with a, a, a slew of strategies, but one of them that we saw immediate gains on was letting our officers substitute so many in-person interactions with video interactions. And what we found, Alex, was, I'll be honest with you, what I would have hypothesized is the opposite. And that mm -hmm. is that the officers were more likely to use these enhanced supervision program skills during a video interaction than they were during in-person contact, which I would have guessed different because I would have guessed, you know, with body language and, you know, staring someone eye to eye, sharing space with them, that's when you're going to use the effective communication skills. But then mm -hmm. you, but anyway, but I clearly was wrong. But then you talk to an officer and they're like, oh yeah, it's much more conducive to use those skills on a video interaction when you don't have dogs barking, you don't have someone cooking dinner, you don't have kids running around. It's just you and the person. Mm. I was, it, would have never guessed it, couldn't have strategized for it. But by getting basic and focusing on, hey, all, all I know is we need to give our officers more time. Um, all I know is we need to make sure these interactions are quality. By focusing everything back on our mission, sometimes you get you get uh you get rewarded. And I think that was uh I think that was one thing that we found there, that officers were more likely to use uh enhanced supervision program skills during a video interaction than they were during an in-person interaction. Wow. I think I would have thought the opposite as well. So that's really great to hear. Um, and I I think I can really resonate with the idea that 77% of people's time is taken up by all sorts of things that aren't the things that we believe are going to lead to better outcomes. And so I love kind of that spin on how can we create some more space? It is the number one thing that we hear from people. We don't have time. We don't have time for anything because we are buried in all this stuff, much of which isn't necessarily connected to our vision and mission. So it sounds like being more strategic in that way has had a, a big impact. Yeah. And you know, Alex, and you know, you bring up a good point. Like, I don't think I've ever heard an officer complain about like, 
working with someone on their caseload. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe one-offs here and there. Sometimes you got difficult cases or clients, yeah. whatever. I've had but, a few. <laughs> but but, mo- but most of the complaints, no, it's the bureaucracy. It's the time drains. It's the, oh, yeah. you know, jumping through, you know, what they what they feel are like hoops. So it's like, if you can take some of those away from them and free them up to do the mission, you know, if you, if you're hiring the right people, then they're going to, they're going to thrive. They're going to thrive. If you free them up to do the mission, it's like, sometimes it's like, it seems so simple, but like letting the officer do their job, right. <laughs> like letting it, freeing them up, you know, it's like, they then come connected because now their experience matches their expectation. They knew what being an officer, what being a community supervision officer was right. They knew what they were getting into. The so so the friction isn't coming from them doing their jobs. The friction is coming because no, their experience isn't ma- at matching what they expected to be doing. So when mm. they come spending 70% of their time doing stuff that they didn't sign up for, <laughs> could not relate it to supervision, then yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have some you're gonna have some discontent. Great point. Great point. Okay, so let's talk about addressing housing needs. What are we looking at here? So so this is the same thing. And so housing needs would be like, you know, you know, someone who's dealing with, you know, residential instability or someone who's dealing with homelessness. And same thing, where you know, officers in the in the previous contact driven model were just running around making those contacts. And even if someone was homeless, you know what I mean? They were they're getting crafty and figuring out where where the people were staying, you know, they go to the, whatever it may be. So when we slowed them down, we got basic, our person-centered supervision model, be like, look, if someone's struggling, you can't house them, right? This goes back to the con- controlling the controllable. You can't house them. You can't create a shelter. But if someone is dealing with homelessness or residential instability, we want you to talk to them about it. We want you to address it with them. We want you to share what information you know to help them na- navigate this difficult time. If they need help getting an ID, help them you know, let them know what that process looks like, link them to the resources in the community so that they can, they can address this housing need. Because much like mental health, housing, uh, homelessness is not a chronogenic need. However, people who are homeless are much more likely to be visible to law enforcement, they're much more likely to get tight tangled up with lo- loitering and stuff like that. So even though there's, there's no increased criminality, there is an increased likelihood of being in the criminal justice system. Yeah. So again, kind of, you know, setting up those pins for the officer. What's a strike look like? Hey, if you're meeting someone and they're dealing with, with housing needs, we, ex- we expect you to talk to them about it. And this is and what's so cool is this is stuff that good officers are already doing. Yeah. So now they're getting credit for it. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So is what we're seeing here, like this shift from saying how many people are housed or unhoused to how many of our staff are talking and trying to address and referring people who are unhoused to the appropriate resources? Well, you know, it it's shifting from, no, of the people who have housing needs, what percentage are, are being addressed, right? Mm. So yeah, so like we could... For just like the board conversation, part of the data we shared is how many people are homeless, right? We can't house people just so we can't give them jobs. That's that's not our mission, right? But what we can tell you is of the people who are homeless, you know, now we're up to, and it's even higher than this now in t- 2024, this is somewhat old data, um, but we, we bumped up 23% of how often if someone was struggling with housing needs, we were helping them address those needs. Wow. Just by shifting your focus, going from big to closer to the vest. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's awesome. All right. For our audience out there, you're awfully quiet. I know you probably have questions because I have a million of them, but we're on a mission. If you are a writer, if you like to take notes, now's the time to have pen and paper because Dr. Powell has laid out some of the top strategies to strategic plan as a discipline versus just a document. So we're going to dig into those. Um, Sound okay, Dr. Powell? It's cool with me. All right. So let's start here with saying no and being disciplined, um, which sounds really easy in theory, but we could all, I could use some help on how to do this in practice. So, so yeah. So when you, when you've identified your strategic vision, right? When you've charted that course from your mission, which is why you exist, to your vision, what you want to become. Not only does it, do you define success, not only do you know the things that 
you need to do on a day-to-day -day -day basis or what how your division can contribute to, to moving the agency from that mission to the vision. It also gives you the power to say no, right? You get all these different things asked of you. And when you're when you've already laid out what success looks like for your agency, you've already laid out that strategic direction, then it, it, it gives it gives you the ability to say no. And we and we and we see this, we see this all the time. People, you know, people come to me all the time and they'll ask to do, you know, do some research projects or something like that. And it's like that doesn't really, that's not gonna help us move, move the needle on going from our mission to our vision. It's not gonna improve the quality of services for our agency. So I'm gonna respectfully say no. <laughs> wow. And, and, in, and and it does, you know, with setting priorities. So the being disciplined, like too, like our um our IT department, we have a great IT department um, that's done all kinds of cool things. But with with all their talents, that also means they they get a lot of asks. Mm -hmm. So they love having and they and they um recognize our chief information officer always says it they recognize that um you know technology itself is never the strategy right that's never the service it's to support the strategy so what they do is they go through all the things that have been asked of them all the different projects that they want to work on they can't possibly do them all and they use the strategic direction of the agency to to rank which ones they need to they what order they need to put them in and then also which ones don't fit with that strategic direction and they can mm. you know, respectfully decline. Wow. Which That's again, awesome. Well, well it, yeah, it's pretty powerful and it's pretty empowering for, again, people, people in this field don't like to, in, in, in other closely related fields, don't like to let people down. Right. right? But you gotta, but you gotta make it bigger than yourself. Right. So when you're, when you're working towards that strategic direction, it's not about like, you know, it's not about getting everybody to like you. It's not being everything to everybody. It's about achieving that that mission to the vision, right? So you may have to temporarily sacrifice a little social capital, yeah, in order to be more productive toward towards your strategic vision. Wow, that's powerful. And what a great, important reminder for all of us that that it makes me think about Dr. Brene Brown and her saying of clarity is kindness that, you're actually being kind to yourself and your organization and your teams by creating these very clear strategic priorities so that it can, it's not personal. I'm not saying no to you because I don't like you or because I have a different agenda. You know, we can all look at this and very clearly say, this isn't aligned with where we're trying to go. And so the answer has to be no. That feels really powerful. That's great. Awesome. All right. Well, that brings us to this piece about vision, North Star, and alignment. Um, can you tell me a little bit about this? Yeah, I, I, this point is so important because, you know, like when I teach strategic planning, when I facilitate conversations, we do it very methodol uh, methodically, right? You know, we go, you know, we, you lay the foundation with your mission, vision, values, then you, then you, then you define your measurable objectives, so like what, what success looks like in those areas. And then you, and then you start crafting out the action steps. This is real, real easy to do in a simulated environment, right? It's real easy to do as a, as a, um, you know, tabletop exercise. That's not what the real world looks like, right? <laughs> so, so really, it's about thinking about that vision, that mission as your north star, so that when, and you can train yourself as a discipline. So when things get real wonky, when you're getting all these different things thrown at you, all these different asks from other stakeholders, you know, like I said, you know public scrutiny, budget cuts, uh, media sensationalism, all the different things that, that you know, someone in, in public service has to deal with, you know, you can step back, take a deep breath, and look at that North Star, and focus on, and that North, by that North Star, I mean that, mis that mission and vision, you know mm -hmm. what I mean, why do we exist, what do we want to become, yeah. and then take just a few minutes to get yourself back aligned, because that's the beauty of, of the, of the North Star, right, that's why I think strategic planning a lot of people call it a roadmap. I feel like that's selling strategic planning a little short. It, it is a roadmap. It's not incorrect, but I, I like to think of it as a compass, right? Because with a compass, no matter what happens, let's let's say let's say you and me go hiking, Alex. A storm comes, we run for cover, we come back, and we can't even find where the trail's blazed anymore. Mm. We're lost. A map isn't going to help us because we don't know which way is which. Oh, but with a compass. Point. With a compass, we can identify true north 
And once we know that, we can find we can find our way out out of that hiking trail. And that's what you mm-hmm. can do with your mission and your vision. So when you feel lost, when you feel overwhelmed, let's go back to that mission vision. Why you got why you came here in the first place? What you're working towards? That's so awesome. Because how often do we feel like there's all these competing asks and being pulled in lots of different directions and stakeholders who want different things and agendas and the like. Um, what a great, I love that visual of what's my true North star. What's my true North. So I can find my way back to what's going to have the biggest impact. Um, and just to help you kind of reset your focus on what's most important. And that, and that's one of the things too, when we say discipline, this is an ongoing pursuit. So it's not if you need to find your way back, it's when. Because we all, I don't care how much you do this, I don't care how good you are at strategic thinking, at strategic decision-making, you're going to get misaligned. The difference is making sure that you've put in the discipline to be able to get yourself realigned by using that North Star. Oh, I love that. Okay. Well, thanks for that. That's what an important reminder. And I just love the difference between a map and a compass. That's great. Okay. This one feels tough. So, you know, the art of sacrifice and not everything is important. This all feels very painful to me. So can you tell me about it? (laughs) Well, if you're trying to, if you're really trying to bone up your strategic planning discipline, Alex, this is, this is the toughest one. And it's, and it's probably the most important one. Strategy is the art of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. We can't have it all. We can't do it all. And what happens when we try to do it all is we end up uh, what they call straddling, right? Because we're trying to hold too many things at one time. That's an unsustainable strategic position, straddling. So eventually something is going to fall, right? But the difference between being strategic or reacting is whether you're going to make what falls, whether you're going to let it happen by design or happen by default. So a strong strategic leader embraces this notion embraces this idea of a of a trade-off right Mm -hmm. when you're faced with two things that you want what can you go give up on so that you can go all in on something else yeah like that's so hard it is and that like the and that's that we made a trade-off with that that mental health conversation i told you about like you know we've got we've got our officers here this 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 mental health program and it's like you know we we've got this this idea of maybe trying to dip our toe in providing some mental health services right which is really real reasonable so so but with the mental health strategy we came up with of of getting a therapist for the officers we gave up this idea of providing any kind of direct services so that we could go all in on supporting our officers and supporting the strategy that was most aligned with our mission and our vision and in hindsight was that the right choice time will tell so far it seems yeah yeah Okay, so you're still learning and still figuring that out. So far, we're getting uh, good feedback, and you know some of the preliminary data looks good. So we're uh, we're actually okay. expanding in, in the middle, expanding the project now. So how cool! Well, stay tuned for more information about that. I want to hear more about that. I'm curious in that moment where you like want to be everything to everyone, which I think I've heard you say is noble but not attainable. I like the way you say that. And you're faced with having to either try to be everything to everyone or really be disciplined and sacrifice. Um, What have you done? Like how, what do you do for yourself to help you navigate those moments where you're probably like, oh, I wish I could do all of this. Do you have any like personal strategies to help you stay focused on the art of sacrifice well yeah so a friend um, wants to know <laughs> asking for a friend <laughs> so whenever i teach a class whether, whether it's at our leadership academy or whether it's you know at you know in the university setting or or anything else i always start the class by asking each student to stand up and answer three questions hmm. or what you do and why you do it and the reason I get them to ask these questions so they can practice conceptualizing and articulating um, their professional identity. 
right? Because mm-hmm. we often, we underestimate the power of identity, right? But it, it's what motivates our choices. It organizes our actions and brings mm-hmm. meaning to our professional lives. So this idea of like getting in touch with your professional identity. So so me me personally, what I'll do is, you know, I, I journal, I meditate. I, I, you know, I like, I like, a, you can tell I'm not a big uh, weightlifter, but I like cardio exercise. I like getting in that flow state. Mm-hmm. reflect back on not only the mission and vision of my agency the mission and vision of my role but also with my professional identity who am i what am i doing why am i doing it because that's really what it is and that's what a strategic leader does but it's, it has to start with you the first step to motivating others is being motivated yourself right yeah. so so really, when you get into these leadership positions, all you're doing is helping people connect that professional identity to that overarching mission and vision. Because everybody's is different. It's unique. You know what I mean? You 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 uh, were probably a little too generous with reading my bio at the beginning. But, you know, that that that's a very uh, uh, unique experience for me. Right. Mm-hmm. Someone else wouldn't find joy, wouldn't find fulfillment and trying to live out my professional identity. Right. So. Yeah. So a uh, big trick for me is what I try to teach other people is always getting back in, in um, connection with that professional identity, who you what are, a with, great... why you do it. Thanks for that. What a great reminder for all of us to like be disciplined in taking the time to reconnect and stay connected to your professional identity so that you can do all of these things that are great in the long run, I'm sure, but hard in the moment sometimes. Um, as we get pulled in all sorts of different directions. Okay, let's look at this one. So build implementation capacity and get out of the way. (laughs) So, yeah, so we talked a lot about this idea of building implementation capacity, like realizing what, not only thinking about what strategy is cool, what strategy is going to be effective, what strategy is going to look good on paper, but also like what, what needs to be in place to foster an environment in which that strategy can be successful. Mm. You know, that's what the the Implementation Leadership Academy is so good at, is helping you teach those skills of like thinking it through a little bit further. What conversations need to be held? Um, what, what, what timing needs to be adjusted, right? Mm. What needs to be taken away so that people have what they need to be successful in implementing that strategy? You can come up with great strategies and action steps all day long, but if you haven't built the capacity for people to be successful in it, it's, you're, it's not going to be it's not going to be delivered with any kind of fidelity or effectiveness. And then this idea of getting out of the way, right? Like, like you go to, a, I think you were talking the other day, Alex, about this, this idea of like, you go to a car dealership and you buy a car, you're going to own that car, right? Yeah. I mean, can, w- would it be ludicrous to go to a car dealership, buy a car and leave without that car and not own that car? I mean, it would be, it would be absolutely ludicrous, but we ask our people to do that all the time. So you're going, you're going to build this strategy, like the mental health strategy. I'm still, you know, I, I monitor the data and stuff like that. But I don't work on it. I don't work on it because I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not over mental health officers. That's not my job as a strategic planner and researcher. That's not my job. So when you, when you create a strategy, you've, you can't just ask people to buy into it. If they mm. buy into it, they need to own it. And I think this idea of, you know, getting out of the way. So it's like once once we got the strategy up and running, and you know, and I and I wasn't the only one who came up with the strategy by any means, but I made sure that I removed myself from. It. I got out of the way so that our it, for us it's a, our recidivism reduction unit that oversees it, and and our field operations um, that oversees the officers. Um, let them own it, but I can't very well. That's what strategic planning can be a little bit. You know, it's it's a team sport, and I think sometimes people don't don't want that because they want. They want the glory. They want their names all over. But when this whole thing's said and done, um, my role in it will be will be long forgotten, hopefully. But the idea is, if 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 you're going to ask people to buy into something, then then they they better own something as well. Otherwise, it's it's just not fair and it's it's not genuine. Such a good point. It makes me think about some of the conversations we've had about how change feels to people, right? If you're leading it, it's energizing. If it's being done to you, it can be really exhausting and depleting. And I love this idea of getting out of the way, like let people own their cars, give give them the tools, build the capacity, make sure they 
have environments where they have the time and the space and the resources to be able to do whatever's within that lane and then let people own it and probably make it better than we could have ever thought it could be when we first thought about it. Oh, that's, yeah, that's it. right. Yeah. Well, especially too, because I mean, when it comes to implementing it, that they're the experts, right? Not, yeah. the, not the strategic planning researcher, right? So they're going to, they're going to make adjustments and, and turn it into something more beautiful than you ever could have imagined, which is what All we're right. seeing right now with that program. I love that. So I'd imagine that this has all been super easy for you, like done now. Strategic planning is, is a discipline and I'm yeah, great, it's a, right? Yeah. It's a part-time job. Yeah. <laughs> I think our conversations have been more aligned with like, whew, this is a lot of work. This is hard. What have you learned through this process? Well, the idea of like, you know, understanding, you know, our commissioner always says, you know, you eat an elephant by taking one bite at a time, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's this idea of like understanding that, you know, yeah, you can you can study, you can do the evidence-based practices where you're, you're constantly monitoring outcome, monitoring data so that you can make adjustments. But the more you dig into it, I mean, the more you're going to find, right? The more there's always there's always work to be done. So making sure that you're you're relishing those milestones, making sure that you're not trying to do too much too fast, making sure that you're setting clear goals and celebrating reaching those goals before moving to the next thing. Mm. Uh, otherwise, it's going to feel like a a daunting, um, endless loop. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And it's, I know we've talked a little bit about kind of this idea that the, this first point here, the more you dig, the more you find, and and that that's not, that doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong. That just means that there's a whole host of work to be done and that that you should be ready, that whatever you decide is your lane, if you're disciplined and stick with it, there will be endless supplies of work to be done That's right. in that space. That's right. Okay. Um. You did mention to me, we did talk a few times about kind of complaining as the symptom and not the problem. What are your thoughts about, or what are your strategies around when you start hearing what sounds like complaints? What do you do with that? I think you got to listen deeper. I think mm -hmm. you got to ask more questions. And I think you got to resist some of the pitfalls of that we like to that we like to step in when we're diagnosing problems. One big one that I think people have done throughout the dawn of time mm -hmm. is blame it on the new generation, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's that's a real easy one to do. It's really easy when people are complaining to just say officers these days. Officers don't know how good they have it, right? And like everybody's always felt that way. Every generation, if, and if we're doing our job then everybody will feel that way, right? Like you would you would think the next generation is going to be better off than, than you did if you if you, you move the ball down the field at all, right? <laughs> so yeah. it's like, you know, that's that, that's actually a could be looked at as a function of success. So um so it's just taking this idea of digging deeper and finding out what's really going on. Because what I've learned is that it's not always easy when when people are dealing with feelings when people are dealing with, you know, abstract topics to make the implicit explicit. And I'll give you an example. I was teaching a, a, a course the other day and we were, it was a, it was a basic, a, a basic management course and the officers or the future leaders uh, were asked to address a, you know, a, uh, like a exercise of like a sample, like problem with an employee. Right. So this real bright, young young woman stands up and starts talking about addressing the employees um use not using those esp skills we were talking about early right mm -hmm. so that's, that's timely and so she starts she starts talking about it and i stopped her i said whoa wait a minute like why are you addressing this why is this an issue because i try to teach them to go ahead first thing you need to figure out that second bullet point there about some things are hard to fix you need to figure out if it's worth it oh yeah if it's not mission critical if it's not significant uh, it it ain't about like getting everybody like you. It ain't about getting everybody to to do things how you used to do it. It's about getting everybody to support that mission and vision. And what's a problem is when you're hindering that mission and vision, mm. right? So and, and your job is to get them 
to do better at supporting it. So, so she says, I said, why is it important? And she says, well, our uh, senior management is just really into ESP right now. And I was like, I was like, really? I said, is that, a, is that our mission to please senior management? She's like, no, but ESP is, you know, like a set of communication skills that evidence shows us will get better outcomes if we use it. And I was like, that was in there. <laughs> and like, and she just spit out like this great thing. But like, sometimes, you know, that's a little harder to do. It takes just a little deeper thinking. That's what she meant. It was ingrained in her, which is probably why she's been earmarked as a future leader. Right. Yeah. It's ingrained in her, but you got to get that out. You got to get, you're trying to address a problem employee you gotta you gotta share that with them you gotta bring that mission alive for them to, to life for them because otherwise you're just telling telling that officer to please you and yet you're mm. not please you you're hiding behind your bosses right but when yeah. you type mission you're bringing that mission to life for them and that and that and that's that's when you can get get it at that deeper level that's really powerful and seems like just a a small nuance right pausing long enough to skip over perhaps maybe our default answer, like your boss wants you to do it this way to like, this is how it could be meaningful and connected to our vision and our mission. And it just, I love that you said it's in there. Like she believes it yet yeah. her default response was because they want us to, that taking that pause can help get you there. That's right. Love it. Well, what would you say has been the best part of this for you or more, most rewarding in terms of shifting your focus and taking a more disciplined approach to strategic planning? Um, to me, is it's, you know, I'm, I've got to circle back to, you know, it, it, it brings my professional identity to the world, right? I mean, I mean, to my everyday life. So, by, you know, I, I got into this work, you know, I, I studied sociology because I believe that there's, you know, social forces at play at a, in a person's life. And I believe that those social forces show up in our criminal justice system, predominantly yeah. and definitely in uh, community supervision. So I think, you know, for me, being able to strategic plan and, and, and research and think about these issues and come up with something like the mental health strategy that might, that might potentially um, improve those intersections, that brings me joy. That brings me fulfillment. Um, it keeps me coming back. Yeah, that's awesome. Have you noticed anything different? You know, we, we talked about getting basic and being disciplined about those things that really, at least how I heard it was like focusing on what people have control and focus over even at the officer level. What impact has this had on line staff? Uh, I, to me, it seems like, you know, and this is somewhat anecdotally, but like to me, I mean, sure. I've, I've shared some data with you. I um, mean, that that with the ESP skills and the addressing housing needs, and we've got other ones we could share with you too. I mean, that's that's their actions, right? Yeah. That's not us doing anything. That's, that's them doing it, putting in the work. Um, but like, I know from like teaching classes and, you know, going to graduations, they seem to be speaking much more on mission. And I think because their experience is better matching their expectation. When they get in and they came into this field because they wanted to help people and they get in here and they're getting asked to deliver person-centered supervision, to meet people where they are, to address these, these tough issues, they're more, I think they're more engaged. They're finding fulfillment and contributing to that because it's speaking to their professional identities. So I think by the, taking this concept of like person-centered supervision, which is just bringing our mission and our vision to life, I think it's helping us stay truer to who we are and stay more aligned for why we're here which is helping staff stay more aligned to why they got into this field. Oh man, that's so powerful. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. That's really exciting, you know, that that there are so many things within our control and influence that we can put some effort and energy into, be disciplined about that could have such great ripple impacts on all sorts of people. It's so exciting. And so I know I'm getting some questions about this part, like, okay, you've inspired me. Now, where do I go? How, what would you tell people or what advice would you give about how they can get started around using strategic planning as a discipline? Well, I think the first thing you got to do is you got to make sure you've got a firm understanding of that, a firm foundation, right? Which starts with you 
as a as a leader, right? As a strategic leader, recognizing that professional identity, spending some time with those three questions, not being able to just jot them out literally with off the top of your head, spending some time being able to answer those three questions in a way that you're proud of, in a way that you feel like it represents you, in a way that you feel like you can live by it, a way that you feel like this is how you want people to talk about you when you're not in the room. So really start with there and then move on to your to your agency. Make sure you got that foundation, a good understanding of those mission, vision, and values. And then spend some time thinking about how your professional identity can go into those mission, vision, and values. So you got to lay that foundation first. And I know that's not always the fun part, right? Like when I get people to write mission statements, like there's talk about tension is where the growth is. There's some tension there when people get asked to write mission statements um, because it's because it's hard. Um, so we but you want to make sure you get that anytime any piece of work that gets in front of you the first thing you want to ask yourself is like what okay what what is our mission here like why are we here what is the purpose if, whether it's a task force whether it's a committee whether it's a new team whether you just got put into a new assignment of a, uh, a new division like first thing you need to ask yourself is like what why are we here why do we exist and you need to make sure you can answer that question otherwise you've got nothing to start strategizing off of oh good point can you remind everyone what those three questions are that they should start with? Who you are, what you do, and why you do it. Perfect. Okay. And all of this seems to go with kind of the example that you gave about the upcoming leader, you know, and kind of her default answer versus her true to herself answer. You've used the term before, speak mission-centered. Um can you tell us a little, it reminds me of that example, but can you tell us a little bit about what you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, and I think that's one of the principles of, of strategic leadership. And, and and when I'm talking about strategic planning as a discipline, that's really what we're talking about here, right? It's recognizing that people don't follow people. People follow missions and visions, right? Mm -hmm. And if and, and that mission and vision, building that foundation, that's how you make this stuff bigger than you, right? I can only get so much done with people trying to please me. But if I got people who buy into a mission or vision, it really don't matter what they think about me. That's a separate, that's a separate issue, right? Yeah. Yeah. Social capital is important, but that's a set, that's a separate thing. But, but when you're speaking mission centric, when you're asking people what, what to do, I mean, that, that, that officer I gave you the example was, was right, right, right there. Like sometimes we get frustrated when our, when our people want the why we get frustrated. They don't just salute and execute. So you need to be prepared and ready to be able to tie everything back to that mission vision. Why are we doing this? Because if you can't answer it, then they sure can't. Yeah, such a good point. And this brings me to one of the questions that's come through here, which is, it sounds like a paraphrasing, but it sounds like your top leadership is on board with you to strategic plan as a discipline, to go deep by getting basic, to really focus on officers and, and staying in your lane. What if you're in an agency that's not as aligned around that? Where would you start to help align people around strategic planning as a discipline and doing all of these things that you've shared with us today? You know that that's a, that's a good question, and and like I said, I, I I'm speaking for a group of people, right? But the thing is, we've gotten better and better at it. Like I feel like you know, and like I said, we meet twice a year, which is kind of a check in, and we can really see our progress because we're all doing it. And I feel like every year, our strategic plans get more meaningful. They get more substance to them. They get more, um, they get more tied to service delivery. Um, uh, but we're doing that as a group. And it's okay. it's okay. Just start. Just start somewhere. You start being strategic. You start speaking on mission. You start speaking on vision. It's real hard to argue with mm -hmm. and visions, right? Why we exist. So like the best way to make positive change is to be the example, is being willing to step in the light. That That's how it has to be done. So it sounds like, you know, if you, if you don't have anybody else doing it, it sounds like it needs to start with you. Oh, I love that. That's great advice. All right. Well, for those of you who are on with us, if you have more questions, send them now. I also want to tell you how appreciative I am that Dr. Powell has agreed to share his contact information. If you have more questions or if you want to talk offline, he has offered to be available. So here is his contact information. Um, is there anything that you were hoping I would ask you today that I 
didn't or that you were hoping to share with that we didn't get to? I hate to do this, but no, I don't, I don't think so. But you, that's okay. You were very prepared and asked some fantastic questions. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I want to let everyone know, Dr. Powell's talked a lot about person-centered supervision and has graciously agreed to let us share that publication with you all. So we're going to be sending out the link to this video along with um, a really easy read, but very good and detailed about what person-centered supervision is and all the principles that he was talking about there. Um, so we'll be sending that to you and sharing that with you um, next week. And uh, we hope that you'll reach out to Dr. Powell if you have questions or want to talk more about how to get started or, or where you might be getting stuck in this process. But I'm just really grateful for you coming here today and sharing your story because I know that I got all giddy when you were sharing it with me. So I'm glad that we can share it with others. And I hope that they will reach out to you. If you're interested in joining our Implementation Leadership Academy, which is where our journey with Dr. Powell began, at least from ACJI and Dr. Powell, we've got a summer class. Actually, I think it's full, but maybe not. Uh, but I do believe it's full, but we've got one in the fall coming. So you can reach out to us and um, we'll let you know. And then we're going to take the summer off from Learn at Work Live. And so we'll be back in the fall with some other of our amazing network sharing their tips and tricks and strategies to help you do your best work in practice. So in the meantime, we hope you'll follow us or join our newsletter or just stay in touch. We want to hear what you want to know and what you want to learn. Um, and so we'll also be, thanks, Diana, in the chat, there's um, some things that you can do. We'll be sending you a little survey to say, what do you want to learn more about? And we will craft some, some opportunities based on that. So thanks everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Dr. Powell, thank you so much for your time. This has been excellent. Um, and we're excited to see you next time. Take care, everyone. Bye.